Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric, and I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. We're talking to people about their work and what's happening in the field with the hopes of making this growing arena just a little bit more accessible to us all. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast, and you can email us at hello at Let's Hear It Let us know if you have any thoughts about what you hear today, including people we should have on the show. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we're back. It's a new year. It's a new podcast. It's a new interview. And it's a new Mr. Brown that I'm seeing across the uh, the interview process same, here. Same old Mr. Brown. Hi, Welcome Kirk. Welcome to Let's Hear It. How's it going? You know, the world is upside down, but we're uh, muddling through. Well, you mentioned this in the uh, interview we're about to hear, which I'll have you set up in a moment, but we do hearts go out to all the people being affected by what's going on. Total chaos, total craziness, and God help us all is all I have to say. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, well, no, I agree. Let's hope that... Let's hope for the best. So tell us what we've got here today, because uh, this is, once again, another really good one on Let's Hear It. Uh, Yeah, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I spoke with Aaron Belkin, who is the founder of the Palm Center, which is a think tank that Aaron created to get the military to undo its don't ask, don't tell policy back in the the 80s, and uh, actually in the early 90s. And uh, and since then, the Palm Center has continued on its really incredible work. And Aaron has was the, was one of the architects of this strategy to get the United States government to undo "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" and to allow gays and lesbians to serve openly, openly and freely in the military. And Aaron is just the most what's the word? Energetic, enthusiastic, intelligent strategist of communications, politics, and anything else you can think of that I've ever met. He's amazing. He's just amazing. And for anybody who takes for granted some of the rights work that's been done, back in the day, the notion of gays and lesbians serving in the military would have been viewed as what would you say, Eric? A joke. <laughs> I mean, well, I okay. No, no, no. I take it back. They they were serving in the military. They just were not allowed to do so op- openly. And if Acknowledge it. And the military would use someone's, someone's homosexuality as uh, an excuse to drum them out. And many, many thousands upon thousands of service people were, were drummed out of the military. And... Obviously, it had a, it, it had a terrible effect on the military, as Aaron was able to prove, not the least of which was when uh, there were the linguists who were Arabic speakers were kicked out of the military for being gay, and therefore there were untold messages that went undecoded in the advance of 9-11. So really good example, and this was one of the many, many, many pieces of research that he that he pursued in order to make the case that that this notion that gays and lesbians would affect unit cohesion was a lie. Yeah, and the word I was going to use was impossible because this would have been perceived as an impossible task when Aaron got started. So Aaron Belkin is the director of the Palm Center, which you can find online at palmcenter.org. Aaron has um, his own his own website at aaronbelkin.org where you can see his books, including How He Won, which is the ebook you reference in the interview we're about to hear. And you can find Aaron on Twitter at Aaron Belkin. Let's listen and then we'll come back. Eric, thank you for doing this. This is a great interview. This is Aaron Belkin on Let's Hear It. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today is Aaron Belkin. He is a scholar, an author, an activist, and a dancer. 
And Aaron, Aaron was a key strategist in the successful effort to get the United States to repeal the don't ask, don't tell policy in the United States military. He's the founding director of the Palm Center, which the advocate named as one of the most effective LGBTQ rights organizations in the nation. He's a professor of political science at San Francisco State University, where he teaches a lecture course on delusion and paranoia in American politics. And also, I just found out, the politics of Harry Potter. I really want to go to San Francisco State. And he's also a truly amazing guy, one of the smartest communication strategists I've ever met. I mean that sincerely. And and actually, I should also note, Aaron, that we are having this conversation right now as bombs are falling in, in the Ukraine. The world is increasingly becoming a challenge. If it could get any more challenging, I just wanted to note that it's a difficult day and a difficult week in a difficult, I don't know, millennium. But thank you for joining us. Uh, it's, uh, I agree that it's, uh, it's uh, terrible. Uh, today, it's been, you know, it's been terrible for a long time. Uh, I guess terrible in new ways today, but um, it's a pleasure to be here. I just wanted to start off with you are, I mean, you were in the middle of the fight to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was seemingly one of the most Sisyphusian goals <laughs> to, like, to take on the U.S. military. Can you just help us understand how this came about? What, what was your thinking? How did this? And then we'll get into the strategy as well. But look, why did you take on the U.S. military? That seems like an interesting way to start. Well, when I was... Um coming out of the closet uh, in the early 90s. That is when President Clinton was trying to lift the military's ban on gays, lesbians, and bisexuals, and he failed to do that. But during the course of that fight, um, uh, opponents um, said terribly violent, um, uh, disrespectful, painful things, uh, even even uh, on the floor of Congress. And so I was in grad school at the time, and so that was um, really um, at the forefront of my mind. I was also studying the military as part of my graduate program. So, so the question of um, military service by gays, lesbians, and bisexuals was was really kind of at the, the intersection of my interests. But, but I'll also say that um, uh, I went to college when um, our university was led by a, a president named Howard Swearer. Um, who was very focused on the ways in which knowledge could be used not just to talk to other scholars, but also to help inform public policy. And so when I became a professor, I wanted to not just produce research for academic consumption, but to try to use research to inform public policy. So it was really the combination of those things. The military seems like a that's a daunting place to start. There might have been, you might have started on marriage equality in some states, for example, or if, if the idea was to help the world be a more hospitable place for gays, lesbians, and, and transge transgender people, as, as you've also expanded that work, w why the military? What was that? Where did you, what, what do you think the, what was the strategy there? Um, I'd always been interested in the military. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I had like a model airplane museum in, uh, in, in our attic. And then I started studying the military as an undergraduate and really never stopped. And my, my doctoral dissertation was, um, I mean, the, the, the field was political science and international relations, but it, effectively it was military studies. And, and I guess just as a young adult, my kind of question that I was asking is why, why would anyone ever join an organization where they would have to potentially kill someone or expose themselves to the risk of, of death? And that, that is a central question of, um, of military studies. But then uh, later in life, I became uh, much more of an anti-militarist, not so much anti-military in terms of concerns about the military as an organization, although there, there is that, but maybe even more importantly, concerns about the militarization of American culture and the, the, the damage it does domestically and globally when citizens worship military ideas uncritically. And so that's just been kind of a through line of my professional life. And, um, and it's, you know, you talked about marriage equality. I mean, the folks doing marriage equality work for, you know, more than three decades had a, had a really steep, steep climb the whole way. And so I, that, you know, that wouldn't have been easy work, but, but it's also not where, I, I mean, I didn't really have any expertise or value that I could add 
there, whereas on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I had some, you know, a little bit of, of experience and expertise and, and, and kind of contacts that, that, that helped me start that conversation. You had said that being part of the military is one of these tenets of American democracy or American participation and that people who are gay were team being told that they didn't belong. Can you talk a little more about that? Well, you know, if you look at uh, kind of studies of citizenship going back a thousand years, the, the marker of first class citizens is pretty much always whether someone can enter into contracts and whether they can serve in the military. And especially in a highly militarized society like our own, when when a group of people is banned from the military, uh, it's all but impossible to lock in citizenship rights in other realms. And so, so opponents of gays and lesbians in the military, I would argue, didn't really care about military readiness or the military. They, they wanted to ban gays and lesbians. And they were exactly right. They wanted to ban gays and lesbians and bisexuals from the military because they knew that if they got away with that, it would be uh, much easier to deprive uh, gays, lesbians, and bisexuals um, of rights, uh, you know, marriage equality or the, the right to teach in schools or, or, or all kinds of rights. And so, um, you know, there are other really, really important questions about the well-being of service members, about the effectiveness of the military. But I agree with with the anti, anti-gay anti forces that, that, that controlling military policy in a way that harms gays and lesbians does great damage um, outside of the military. Now, you wrote this really, really smart book, uh, uh, taking apart or kind of going into the, the strategy that, that you helped to employ in, in removing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And uh, it's a book. It's, it's an ebook. It's available on wherever you get your books for five bucks. Everyone has five bucks. You should get the book. It's called How We Won. And I want to just take I want to have a conversation about the basically the five strategies that you talk about in this book. And I really, really encourage anybody to read it because there's you can apply this to so many other things. Just the kind of sharpness of thinking is is out of out of control. The, your, your first tenet here was target the opposition's lies. And we, so we learn in communications kindergarten uh, never to repeat the message of the opposition, even if you're trying to debunk it. Do you agree? I, I think that's bullshit. I think, so there's a Berkeley professor named George Lakoff. I think he's still at Berkeley. I believe he did great damage to progressive politics about 15 years ago when he published a book urging uh, progressives to focus more on framing. And there was an example of um, the Bush administration uh, had proposed a bill to, basically it was a giveaway to the oil, gas, and coal industry, and they called it the Clear Skies Initiative. And so Lakoff's point was, was look, you know, as soon as the other side framed their bill as the Clear Skies Initiative, they won. And so progressives need to get slick about their framing and need to be as slick as conservatives are about their framing. So we should, yeah, never repeat negative messages, but also never use the other side's frame. And and, and the problem with that is that, and I would argue that progressives have overlearned in very counterproductive and dangerous ways have overlearned that message. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that in a minute. But the problem with that is that, yeah, Republicans and conservatives need to lie and slickly frame their policies because their policies are designed to injure people. Their policies, without exception, are designed to injure scapegoats and or to help plutocrats, um, which means injuring everyone who's not a plutocrat. And so, of course, they have to lie about their policies and, and frame things in disingenuous ways. But the strength of progressive politics is that we want to help people, and that's the truth of what we want to do. And and you, you might say, oh, well, duh, that's obvious, um, no big deal. But it's not obvious, and I would argue that progressives are afraid of the truth of our own Policies and let's just take the, the 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 simplest example taxes. What it means to be a progressive is to believe in big government and high taxes. But how many progressive groups have worked to give democratic politicians cover with the message that high taxes are a good thing? You know, you might say oh, high taxes are a good thing. No, no, that's that's terrible. We could never frame things that way. Well, that's right. We could never frame things that way because we haven't done the decades of public education work that needs to be done to educate the public that government is good and that high taxes are good. You got to say that. You have to say high taxes are a good thing. You can't frame your way out of that um, with bullshit. And so on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, yeah, we use the other side's frame. When I when I came into the Don't Ask, Don't Tell conversation, um, the conversation was like this. Um, 
opponents of gays and lesbians in the military were saying that gays and lesbians hurt the military. And the most important thing is the lives of our service members. And so, yeah, it sucks to ban a people, a group of people from the military, but, you know, we can't risk our service members' lives and gays and lesbians undermine readiness and unit cohesion. And the response um, of, of my community was, that's unfair and anti-democratic and inconsistent with American values. And and, and I thought that that framing was, was very was not going to work because I could see that if any politician ever stepped forward to argue that Don't Ask, Don't Tell should be repealed, as long as generals and admirals with a straight face could say that gays and lesbians hurt the military, uh, then we no politician could ever pre- prevail on Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal. So, so there were a lot of things that needed to happen to get Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal across the line, including lobbying and litigation and grassroots advocacy. But, but my sense when I entered the conversation in, I guess, about late 1998, so five years after the policy had put in, been put in place and about 12 years before it would be repealed, was that we had to win on the other side's argument. So let's use their frame. Okay, they want to talk about military readiness, fine. But let's use research to show... The, so so the other side was lying about military readiness. And, you know, the, the, the research show that inclusion actually helps the military. So let's make that argument that, that based on research, inclusion helps the military and it's discrimination that hurts the military. So we repeated the negative message. We used the other side's frame. But over time, we prevailed on our message, and that opened up a space for litigators and lobbyists and grassroots activists to push the policy across the line. And so you started the Palm Center, I think at the time it was at UC Santa Barbara, as a yep. research center, among other things, but a research center that gave you the opportunity to conduct the kind of research to put the lie to the fact that gays in the military uh, affects unit cohesion, among other things. And one of the, again, we learn in communications kindergarten that facts don't really matter. We have to tell stories. We have to appeal to emotions. But you spent a lot of time doing research and putting out facts. Why did facts matter? Well, facts mattered because we needed to suck the oxygen out of the Pentagon's lie that gays and lesbians hurt the military. And in order to suck the oxygen out of that argument, we had to show through research that the argument was wrong. But, you know, the research already showed that, and I, I want to step back, you know, we, Palm Center is, you know, we're still up and running. We're, we're a think tank. We are a think tank. We were a think tank. For as long as we run, we will remain a think tank. And we, you know, we publish our research in state-of-the-art peer review journals. So, so that's not nothing. But that really wasn't the only point of doing the research. The point of doing the research was to design media campaigns around each study. We didn't just want a study asking, have gays and lesbians undermined the British military, which allowed gays and lesbians to serve many years before we did. We wanted to do that study, but then have the New York Times report on that study on the front page. And so the real the real value added was not really doing the research, but doing the research and then getting media coverage of the research. And so, so the reason facts mattered is because we thought that over time we would be able to persuade uh, generals and admirals and thought leaders and journalists and 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 in turn the public at large, not not by avoiding stories. We we you know we still you know featured stories of you know when we released our study of the British military, we also gave the journalist a gay submariner who'd been kicked out of the Royal Navy for being gay and then let back in when the ban was lifted. So we 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 emphasized the story, but but a story about a gay submariner. Let let me say it this way. You know, we want our studies and our talking points to be used as aggressively as possible in Washington. Like, what's more credible, a New York Times story about a gay submariner in the British military who's doing a good job, or a story about a gay submariner in the British military who's doing a good job, and a study by the University of California that has interviewed every expert in the world on the topic and shows that uh, gays and lesbians have helped the British military. So if you want someone in Congress to be able to use that article, the article and the research have to be paired. Like the, in the minds of a member of Congress, the study doesn't exist until it gets media coverage, but the journalist is more likely to cover the story if there's a research component and new data. It d- doesn't mean the new study will always get research, and actually it's quite hard to get media coverage of research, so we had to get um, you know, clever about that over time. But but the point is that we had to get, just drill the research into the public conversation again and again and again and again. And it's and one of my chief challenges with researchers are often you will ask them, what are the implications of your research? And they'll say, Meh. 
not my problem. Tenure, that's my problem. And yeah. and being able to take that research and marry it to communications efforts and campaigns feels like a no-brainer. And a lot of folks uh, don't seem to have brains. And you did. Well, and you, so you did this like three times a year for 10 years. You're the well, energizer bunny of research and communication. Yeah. We, so we released three or four studies a year for 10 years and did really aggressive media campaigns around each one. And, and it, it pretty much worked every time. So we had about 35 different times. We, we made national news at the level of like AP or Network News or New York Times or Washington Post with the message that, you know, new research uh, – Gays and lesbians in the military success, discrimination hurts the military. And so, and, and this, you, you want to talk about the tactics in the book. I think the second tactic was iteration or yes. repetition. Yeah. So from a, from a scholar's point of view, that was a very, very boring strategy because we were asking the same research question in every single study and scholars don't like to ask the same research question every single study. It's not interesting. Now we asked the question in a different empirical context um, so that was interesting, um, but from a theoretical sense, we weren't we weren't investigating anything new, and we we knew what the answers to the research was likely to be, not because we cooked the books. And in fact, when we would discover evidence that was that showed that gays and lesbians and bisexuals hurt the military, we would you know be very loud and do press releases about that. But the preponderance of evidence showed that we were right, and so doing research about that evidence would pretty much always turn up the same answer. But the reason that we had to iterate, which is something that scholars just hate doing, and even think tanks that are not, you know, in universities, but it, it's 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 hard to attract funding on just doing the same thing again and again. So 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 I don't think people who don't use this strategy are stupid. I think there are good reasons for not using the strategy. But but the importance of iteration is it, it kind of it's 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 almost like an advertising strategy. The scholars already knew that gays and lesbians don't hurt the military, but but we had to prevail in the court of public opinion. If you if you saw one Honda Motors commercial in your life, then when you would go to buy a car, you'd, you'd never even think of Honda. But if you see Honda Motors uh, com car commercials again and again your whole life, then there's a chance you'll buy a Honda. And it, it was the same w with us. You know, if you do one great study and get media coverage on it, that's not going to inform public policy or the public conversation or move polls. You have to find a way to get journalists to cover your message based on research again and again and again and again and again and again. Steady drip over time. That's what we found moved public opinion and moved uh, grass top and elite, uh, or, you know, thought leader opinion as well as and, and generals and admirals. The energy with which you attacked that strategy, I think, is is really amazing. We're going to be right back with Aaron Belkin uh, right after this break, and we'll continue talking about about his work. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications, hosted by Kirk Brown and Eric Brown. Let's Hear It is sponsored by the Communications Network, which connects, gathers, and informs the field of leaders working in communications for good. Because foundations and nonprofits that communicate well are stronger, smarter, and vastly more effective. You can find Let's Hear It online at letshearitcast.com or on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. Thanks for listening, and now back to the show. Welcome back to Let's Hear It. I'm sitting here with Aaron Belkin, the founding director of the Palm Center and one of the key strategists in the successful effort to get the U.S. to repeal the don't ask, don't tell policy. So the next the next part of your strategy was to recruit validators. Now, that one, that makes sense to almost everybody that the right messenger is sometimes even more important, but at least as important as the right message. It seems to me that a high watermark or an important turning point was when the former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, John Shalikashvili, wrote an op-ed calling for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't, Don't Tell. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there was there was nothing more important than finding validators for our our message. You know, it's, it's kind of the difference between um, a nutrition scholar releases new study uh, that shows that, you know, overconsumption of sugar causes diabetes versus, you know, former CEO of a sugar company cosigns or releases a statement or a study showing that, um, you know, overconsumption of sugar uh, or, or, you know, former CEO of Coca-Cola or something like that, or McDonald's, the sugar causes diabetes. So, so for us, I mean, you know, I was at the time a University of California scholar. Our, our research, we were publishing our research in military journals, but but the 
folks who oppose gays and lesbians and bisexuals in the military, even before the Palm Center did anything, I mean, literally, just we, we just kind of planted our flag in the ground and said, we're open for business, um, started referring to us as um, homosexual activists and San Francisco homosexual activists. So, so when they went to Congress to lie about the evidence and say that gays and lesbians hurt the military, they were scholars informing public policy with evidence. And when we just put a shingle out, um, uh, we were homosexual activists from San Francisco. And so... You know, we and we did lots of things to inoculate ourselves from that, um, you know, that back and forth, having, you know, distinguished scholars do our studies and publish in the best journals. But that game was always going to continue. And so, so, so the most important thing, or one of the most important parts of our tactic, tactics and strategy was to find generals and admirals who would carry our message for us. And, and we spent a lot of money and a lot of time, years and years, um, looking for validators. And it was hard because, you know, at, at the beginning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, there was a survey that showed something like 97% of generals and admirals supported Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so um, that changed when our partner organization, Service Members Legal Defense Network, uh, they found uh, six or seven retired generals here and there to speak out from time to time. And then, and then three uh, retired generals came out of the closet in the New York Times and uh, came out of the closet as, as gay men, and um, and 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 then one of those uh, retired um, uh, general and flag officers knew um, General Shalikashvili's neighbor. Uh, general Shalikashvili was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and 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 the neighbor um, was in P flag because uh, th- they were a Marine Corps colonel and they had a kid who was gay or lesbian. I can't remember or by. Um, anyways, so over the course of uh, uh, so, and we got an introduction to General Shalikashvili, and 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 we held four meetings with General Shalikashvili. We flew gay service members to talk to him. We we told him about the research. Um, he met with some advocates, and so after a year, um, yeah, then then we helped him uh, publish a. a New York Times op-ed saying that he had been wrong about gays and lesbians, that that it's actually discrimination that hurts the military, not gays and lesbians, that inclusion helps the military. And then that op-ed became, I would say, pretty much the most important document in the in the repeal conversation. We followed that up by spending about two years of staff time and $100,000 and $100, getting 104 other generals and admirals to sign a statement calling for the end of, of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And that also got national news. And so we work closely with military professors, uh, former service members, current service members in some cases. So yeah, finding validators was a, was a critical part of what we were doing. And you had mentioned in your book that when you got the 104 generals, that there was a, a kind of a response to it by the, by the far right, that you felt uh, you, you were questioning out uh, out loud whether this was a, a, a tactic that back, backfired on you. Can you, can you just chat about that a little? Sure. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we spent two years, a hundred thousand dollars, you know, getting 104 generals and admir- we didn't pay the generals and admirals. It's just in staff time. It cost, cost a lot of money to reach out to get 104 generals, retired generals and admirals to, to say that, you know, discrimination was hurting the military. And, uh, the other side uh, just snapped its fingers and I- I'm sure had access to uh, email lists of retired general and flag officers through the re- probably the Retired uh, Officers Association of America or something like that is, is my guess. And immediately got a thousand former generals and admirals to sign a statement say that gays- saying that gays and lesbians hurt the military. But even though they had 10 times more validators than we did, their statement didn't really have much of an impact because those validators weren't surprising for the message they were carrying. Now, I, I would argue if, if if the other side had been able to get 10 gay lesbian activists to say that Don't Ask, Don't Tell should not be repealed or that, or that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was helping the military, that would be more persuasive than a thousand generals and admirals carrying that message. Because the, the, the point is that the validator has to be carrying an unexpected message. Your next strategy was to build from within. Essentially, get inside the other side's fortress, if you will, if you want to torture the the metaphor. But you became guest professor, and you you lectured inside a number of military colleges and things like that. What was that like? How did you pull that off, and what was the effect? Yeah, there was it was hard to get in at first, um, and I really wanted to get in because the service academies are so important within military culture for. Um, thought leadership and 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 just kind of networks of, of of influencers, but you can't just kind of walk in the door. And 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 we wrote to 
the, the heads of many, many military universities asking for invitations. And I think we got one response that just said no. Military universities often send their faculty to, to civilian conferences. And so I, I made friends with a West Point professor at, a, at an academic conference and I waited six months. And then I was like, hey, you know, could I just pay my own way to New York and kind of come on up to West Point? And you could give me a tour. And he said, of course. And then I think it was six months later, I, I emailed and I was like, hey, you know, do you think next year I could come at the Palm Center's expense, you know, you won't have to pay anything and just maybe, you know, talk to a few cadets or faculty members. And and yes, of course. And then over the years, um, the lectures got bigger and bigger until at one point I was lecturing something like 500 cadets um, at, at West Point. And, and over the years, I, I used to have an exact count, so I, I can't remember the exact number, but I, I gave something like 30, I, I don't know, 30, 40 lectures at West Point in Annapolis Air Force Academy, the war colleges and would go back year after year. And, um, and, and, and that was important for a few reasons. Um, one of which is that, um, I built up a list of about a hundred current and former military faculty members who agreed with the research. And, 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 and you know, the, the presentations is, especially in the military settings were never advocacy presentations. They're always, all right. Let's talk about military readiness. You care about military readiness. Let's look at what the research says. Is discrimination helping or hurting military readiness? So, so, so the folks who invited me weren't doing advocacy. They just wanted to make sure that their internal conversations were based on evidence. So those allies that I, that I met and cultivated, they could take the research and take the presentations and have quiet conversations behind closed doors in places I could never get to. And over time, um, that really helped, and it helped so much that when the Pentagon finally did decide with Congress to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they flew one of the people I had worked most closely with from the Air Force Academy to Washington and had that person uh, temporarily um, assigned to the Pentagon for a year to write the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal plan. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's literature on, you know, even um, what it takes to move policy in the church, and it's Mary Katzenstein wrote a book called Insider Outsider Partnerships or whatever. But the point being that that there there are things outsiders can do that insiders can't, and there are things insiders can do that outsiders can't. And so you want to try to like work together if possible. And your fifth strategy was to expose hypocrisy, which just sounds like lots of fun. Do you have any favorite stories about how when you exposed hypocrisy that you really felt that you'd you know made some advances? Um. I, I could tell you a failed story. Um, Those are I, fun I re- too. <laughs> I like this one, but um, in the so we won on our argument. You know, it, you just couldn't, with a straight face, make the case that gays and lesbians hurt the military, especially after the Arabic linguist story um, that we broke. That you know, cables for 9-11 had sat untranslated because we didn't have enough Arabic linguists, but they were firing Arabic linguists for being gay. Like that, that was the day when we broke that story, when the military lost to the public forever. So, so we won on our argument, but that didn't mean the policy was going to be repealed. But fast forward to 2010 and Barack Obama and members of Congress were trying to repeal the policy, which ultimately succeeded. But during Senate testimony, there was a retired three or four star general from the Marine Corps uh, testified in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee that the Srebrenica massacre had happened because Dutch peacekeepers included gays and lesbians. Uh, the, the, and if you can't connect the dots there, which it's pretty weird dot connecting, but I'm going to need a protractor meant, and a sextant. But yeah, yeah. yeah what, he, what he meant was gays and lesbians undermine the military. Uh, the Dutch peacekeepers were the military unit assigned to protect civilians in Srebrenica. The Dutch military allows gays and lesbians. Those gays and lesbians undermine unit cohesion. Therefore, the worst massacre since World War II up to the time uh, happened because of gays and lesbians in the military. So you can't lift the American gay ban because we'd have the same problem. And and Senator Levin, uh, the former chairman of Senate Armed Services, he used to wear his glasses down by his nose and he, he put them even lower and he, like looked over his glasses. He's like, do you want to rephrase that? And the general's like, no. He's like, you, you sure about that? And the, the, the general stuck by his guns. And so I, I just thought it would, I mean, and, you know, the Dutch Ministry of Defense, and I think even the Dutch Prime Minister immediately put out statements that said that, you know, this guy was fucking nuts and like, what the hell was, I mean, because, you know, th- that's not a good look. It's, first of all, a fucking lie. And it's also like not a good look for the Dutch military, you know, that that senior American military uh, personnel are making that claim. But I, I thought it would be really, I mean, you know, it's a very tragic and somber moment because the Srebrenica massacre was a, was a human disaster. And, but 
this was so ridiculous. I thought it would be great if um, if uh, survivors groups would put out statements saying that uh, that the general was 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 off his rocker, um, and I tried to get them to do that, and they they wouldn't do it. So um, that was a, a failed effort to uh, elevate hypocrisy, but it was fun to try. Uh, yeah, and the most tortured syllogism I think I've ever heard. <laughs> now, okay, so, so you you win the re- repeal of don't ask, don't tell. Then you went on a campaign to uh, to address the problem of trans people being being kicked out of the military or not being able to get medical treatment and other things. Yep. So you went you went from the easy thing to the harder, <laughs> or the impossible thing to the even more impossible thing, and you managed to pull that one off in three years. Can you talk a little bit about that? I thought that one would take fifteen years, um, and it ended up taking three. Although then. Donald Trump came in and reinstated the transgender ban, and now Biden has uh, reinstated inclusive policy. And I'm sure future Republican presidents will try to reinstate the transgender ban, and they will lie about the evidence to do so, just like Trump lied. Um, um, yeah, the, the structure of that conversation was was analogous to the Don't Ask, Don't Tell conversation because uh, defenders of discrimination were lying about the evidence and saying it was a different lie. So with gays, lesbians, and bisexuals, it was GLB troops under my unit, unit cohesion. And with trans troops, the lie was that trans troops are not medically ready to serve and the military couldn't possibly provide health care for trans troops. And that's just complete bullshit. And so we used research um, to generate media headlines to show that um, the military was not telling the truth. And that opened up a space for repeal. It just happened a lot quicker. I, don't ask, don't tell repeal gave us some some tailwinds as, as well as a policy that I did not work on. But the the repeal of the combat exclusion rule that that banned women from combat positions was also repealed during the trans military campaign. And that was important because it meant that anyone in any gender could do any job. Uh, and, and, and if that hadn't been the case, then there would have been all kinds of opposition arguments to to repealing the trans ban that oh, oh you have a tra- you have a, a man serving in the army you, you know in the rangers special forces and you find out that she's actually a trans woman so what sh- what are we going to do about her job once she transitions but that you know all those are, are arguments were off the table once the combat exclusion rule was lifted so anyways the strategy worked the politics of trans rights nationally were changing and we had we had some momentum from don't ask don't tell repeal um, but the, the ultimate outcome of the conversation is yet to be determined just because the Republicans clearly want to roll that back like they already did. Uh, OK, so now you got the trans situations to sort it out, at least for the moment, at least under presidential decree. But and now you're working on expanding the Supreme Court because you just don't like sleeping, I think, is what <laughs> it is, because you just have too much energy. Can you talk a little bit about your work now to so to take back the court, I think, is, is how you frame it? Yeah, so I just got scared when uh, Mitch McConnell stole the Supreme Court uh, because the Supreme Court has been sabotaging democracy for a generation in order to help the Republican Party win elections, to put it simply. I mean, that's why the the Supreme Court dismantled the Voting Rights Act. That's why the Supreme Court dismantled campaign finance uh, limitations. That's why the Supreme Court um, has blessed uh, hyperpartisan gerrymandering. It's it's all you know. It's, I don't think there's a smoky back room where John Roberts and Mitch McConnell sit down together to coordinate things, but but they're, they're all acting in tandem um, on behalf of plutocrats to hurt everyday Americans. And um, when the court was stolen, that uh, to my mind uh, put us in a situation that was unique in American history, where three things came together simultaneously in a way that had not happened before. We had doses of all three things, but not simultaneously, at least in my uh, knowledge of American history, which is, first of all, you had a stolen court. Uh, Second of all, you had a court that was proactively sabotaging democracy, you know, blocking black people from the polls. And then third of all, you had a court that was clearly unwilling to let future presidents and congresses deal with planetary emergencies like climate uh, climate catastrophe. Um, And there was an obvious solution. This was 2018, so Trump was still president. But there was an obvious solution, which is that if the Democrats were to come back into power, um, they could expand the Supreme Court. Um, and there are counter arguments to that. But when you look at the counter arguments uh, for five seconds, they, they they fall apart. Like they don't make any sense. They 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 look good on paper, but they they don't withstand scrutiny. But the problem was that um, 
the idea of court expansion had been taboo for 81 years since 1937 because there was a conventional wisdom that Roosevelt had failed to expand the Supreme Court. That's not the way uh, we and other historians read the history. I mean, President, we, we believe that the preponderance of evidence shows that President uh, Roosevelt's effort to expand the Supreme Court frightened the court into upholding New Deal legislation, which is why we still have the Social Security Act. So we don't see that as a failure at all. But we had to find a way to kind of get this idea to not be taboo so that so that Democrats could threaten to expand the Supreme Court and ultimately enact court expansion. So I'm really proud, fast forward uh, three years to today. So at the time when the project launched, we had zero members of Congress in favor of the idea and zero organizations. Today, we have 51 members of Congress, uh, including Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Tina Smith and Senator Ed Markey, supporting uh, uh, court expansion bills in Congress. And we have 103 organizations, including very powerful organizations like SEIU, calling for expansion. And every time the court does something terrible, uh, momentum grows. And, and that, that dynamic is now uh, in, in place to continue into the future. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what Take Back the Court does. Do you have a prediction? When, when, when will we be expanding the court to 13 seats? I think that when history, if, you know, civilization still exists and there are historians in the future, um, I think they will look back in this, at this era. And I think the key question is, it's not really just court expansion, but it's will Republicans drive democracy into a ditch before Democrats unrig the system? So, so, you know, Democrats need to get rid of the filibuster pass very aggressive democracy legislation that would ban voter suppression and gerrymandering and dark money and grant statehood to D.C. and Puerto Rico and other things like that and expand the court to protect that legislation because if they pass the legislation but don't expand the court, the court will kill the legislation. So so the question is, like, will the Democrats uh, restore democracy or will the uh, Republicans permanently kill it? I, I would say the Republicans, if I had to bet, I would say the Republicans will kill democracy and we will end up with an authoritarian system. But I hope I'm wrong and I'm doing what I can to make that, you know, prevent that from happening. Well, you are the most optimistic pessimist <laughs> I've, I've ever met. And, and really, uh, I think a, a teacher to me, I've been following your work and learning from you for, for many, many years. I hope that we've introduced you to some to smart people out there who will continue to learn from you and to and to build on what you've created. Uh, Aaron Belkin, it's such a pleasure and an honor to to have this conversation with you. Thank you so very much. My my pleasure. I really appreciate it. And we're back. So once again, I can't help but saying that these interviews just make me think I've wasted my life. <laughs> these are people of real consequence <laughs> that have you, done real things. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what, Kirk, it's true. Yeah. You've wasted your life, and so have I, because <laughs> standing yeah. next to Aaron. What do you have to show for it? Nothing. Just nothing. You know? <laughs> nothing. So I want to jump to the end of the story for a second, because I feel like Aaron has once again decided to do the impossible. And let's go through the book and the five strategies and, and Don't Ask, Don't Tell, because that's really just such exciting and important work to hear about. But now Aaron jumps to... Let's take back the Supreme Court. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. He, well, his argument, I think, is a really interesting one, which was when the Supreme Court, when they when they determined that there would be nine justices in the Supreme Court, it was because there were nine circuits in, mm -hmm. in, in the courts. And now there are 13 circuits. And so mm -hmm. why not have 13 justices? It's not as though it, it's not in the Constitution. This is something that is changeable. So- well, and, and you start feeling the presence of the kind of strategy Aaron works with because I feel like I know more about the Supreme Court as a result of all of this work to rejigger it than I've ever – I'd never thought about it before, right? And so all of a sudden, just in your in your daily life, you're starting to get bit by bit, piece by piece, the building blocks of this awareness of like, oh, why is it this way? Oh, what are the impacts of this? Oh, how does the court actually serve the few versus the many? And – and just and so again, I mean, another impossible task, but this step by step, bit by bit process that Aaron is describing, it just feels so right. You know, it just feels like this is what the work has to look like. But jump me then back to don't ask, don't tell. And again, I always like to ask you from the context of somebody who sat in these seats within major foundations, I can only imagine the challenge Aaron would have had 
uh, going out to find resources to take on maybe one of the most impossible tasks ever, which is, you know, let's let's start addressing rights and equity issues just squarely in the context of the military. I mean, how would how would you how would you imagine how difficult that was for Aaron to do that work? There were a few funders who were funding things around marriage equality and and undoing don't ask don't, don't tell. There were a few. There weren't many. Uh, and and the few that did it were were resolute and incredibly patient and understood that these things take time. And I think for any funder out there who's working on an issue that matters, you have to understand that in many instances, these things take time. Also, mm -hmm. that change is not linear. It's not like we're going to get a little better this year and a little better the year after that and a little better the year after that. In many instances, you're flatlining for a long period of time and then some brief window opens and you go diving through it and you can achieve great things. And as Aaron said, that he didn't think that he was going to be able to secure trans rights for, the, for people serving in the military for decades and it happened in three years. So some of these things happen as a, as a result of, of just kind of the political planets align and and you have to be ready. And so that's, again, one of these real, real arguments for patience as a funder to make sure that you have people with resources who have are ready to go, are ready to respond, and I would say even at least as importantly, ready to defend your wins. Because a lot of folks say, okay, well, they win, they, re they roll up shop and they go away. And I'll tell you what, Aaron is still out there banging away, ensuring that these rights stay won. And as, as you already saw, uh, the Trump administration undid the trans, yeah, sure. uh, the, the reversal of the trans ban, and then the Biden administration put it back. You know, so uh, these things are never fully won, and you have to be there ready for when that day happens that somebody attempts to undermine your victories. Just look at what's likely or could possibly happen with Roe versus Wade. So yeah. the, you know, the patience is, is, <laughs> is the watchword here. Well, and the instinct, the strategic sensibility, because, you know, you applaud Aaron as one of the best and greatest communication strategists that you've ever met. And that comes out from the very first words of this interview when he starts talking about why the military, you know, because, again, the notion of, um, you know, LGBTQ plus rights within the context of the military just you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it just would have been not unheard of. Like you would never even want to introduce that conversation in that setting. And Aaron's done the work to say, and this is the systems thinking part of it, right? He's saying, you know, actually, if you want to talk about citizenship and rights, you talk about contracts and you talk about military service. And so let's go there. Let's, let's have that conversation first. And then we'll actually build an umbrella of rights around the rest of these considerations. And I think that these, these, you know, campaigns, cause there's a, there's a parallel campaign on the marriage equality side, right. You know, where we're talking about, Hey, if we're going to have rights, let's actually treat people like people who have rights in right. all these settings, right. Exactly. Go to the most important settings. I just think that's genius. But I also think that work is so hard to advocate for before it's been shown that it can work. Right. Like, like I, again, I can't imagine walking into a room when this is not, when this is first being hatched, and saying you're actually going to work in the military setting first. Here's why. I just think that's. I think that insight is just so profound. It's amazing. Yeah, Aaron also takes on some of the sacred cows of left leaning political communication strategy, like George Lakoff and framing. Uh, you know, he he just goes right at Lakoff, and I mean, he makes a really great point. If the other side is lying, you have to call out the lies. You can't just pretend those lies didn't happen and come up with your own new way of, of framing an issue. You just have to call the lie, the lie. And, um, and by the way, uh, Aaron, I, <laughs> Aaron has been the saltiest of, <laughs> of interviewees on, on let's hear it. I, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, Hey, look, uh, <laughs> After 30 seconds of Ted Lasso, you've heard more F-bombs than, than Aaron dropped in the whole episode, so I think we're probably okay. Uh, it's you know Same thing with research. We, we've been told that research doesn't matter, that facts don't matter, and what he did was he used research as an opportunity to advance a, a media narrative, and yeah. that these two things went hand in hand. And he also had folks that he understood that he wasn't always the messenger, that he got you know generals out there yeah. and the former uh, chair of the joint chiefs so these things are he, he really understands how you build a how you build a movement how you make a case and how you 
he, how you win. And yeah. I, like I said, I said in, in when I was talking to him, get the book. It's an ebook. It's five bucks. It's called How We Won. You can get yeah. it on Amazon, and it is. I mean, it's worth its weight in gold. So five strategies mapped out in How We Won for why this um, campaign around don't ask, to, don't tell is successful. And you know, when you guys were talking, I was thinking about these words we describe sometimes when we do communications work. We talk about goals, and then you talk about strategy, and then you talk about tactics. But it also felt like there was a fourth dimension that um, was kind of the piece that Aaron kept on going back to, which was just the absolute day in, day out persistence and resilience required to make that work go. And I thought that that framing conversation and talk the, talk the opposition's lies was so interesting. And I, and I will say, right, that's that's very unusual to hear somebody say George Lakoff did a lot of damage to the progressive community, right? And and but but then I think that there's a there's a thread in there which is like. Let's learn the right lesson when we're having these conversations, right? Let's not let's not take away the wrong lesson. And in and, and the wrong lesson, as Eric is talking about, or as Aaron is talking about it, is let's not be afraid to tell the truth of the right. policies that we're supporting. And I have to say, that was like a lightning bolt of just clarity from the heavens because it's right. true. It's like let's just say what's true. Let's try that. What do you think about that? I mean, it's just I I, yes. I love it. I totally agree. And I it doesn't take much of a leap to understand how you would adapt much of what Aaron's strategies have been to any host of other issues, right. whether it's climate, whether it's uh, women's reproductive health and rights, uh, race, all these things. So these are these are really important lessons. And I, I also think that one of the assets that that Aaron really brings is just indefatigability. This guy mm. does not rest. And that's really important. And ooh, and he doesn't get bored with his own message, which mm -hmm. is one of the, I think, cardinal sins of, of communications is that we say something a few times and then we get bored. It's like, ooh, everybody knows that. Let's just move on and come up with some new way to talk about the thing that we're saying. Right. And he right. never, never wavered from his core message, which is that you know, gays and lesbians should be able to serve openly and proudly in the military that they in that discrimination harms the military it harms our democracy it harms our 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 military readiness all of those things and that and he just never stopped on that and other folks they'll they'll try and find new novel ways of saying their thing and and what they end up doing is undercutting their own power but because people forget what it was that they were saying in the first place, you did. You knew exactly what what Aaron was working on. You knew why he thought it mattered. He and he took every single possible opportunity to say the same thing, uh, often using different kinds of evidence. But it was it was all ma making the same point. That's such a powerful lesson, and it's something that we really, really, really need to listen to. No, it's so difficult, and there's so many reasons why it's so hard to stick there. And funder fatigue being one of them. Right. You know, because 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 very few funders will say, oh, look, just copy and paste last year's proposal. As long as you have evidence of success, let's keep at it. Right. We're going to we're going to we're going to update it. We're going to do it differently in today's context. But the underlying work is going to be we're just going to keep hitting on this again and again. And it actually makes me wonder, what do you call that? Like, is that is that persistence? Is that like, hey, well, here's the playbook and we're going to keep rolling it out and keep working it and working it. What is that? Is that a goal? Is that a strategy or a tactic? Or is it all, or is it something else? You know, or is it the bow that wraps it all around? Because I feel like sometimes when we have these conversations about different tactical interventions, different strategic frameworks, hey, what, what, how are our goals shifting? Sometimes the piece we're missing is that 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 message discipline, that repetition of approach, that that's actually the hard earned work of actually securing change, and and it's almost like it's like so necessary. But since it's kind of the oxygen in the room, we kind of miss it a little bit because it's invisible. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, what it is is a precondition for success. Yeah. That you yeah. have to be willing to to be there for the long term. You have to be patient. The other thing is, and and I think you know, you say you have to you have to to show continued success. That's actually that's not always possible. What you have to do is have a firm conviction that you're right, mm -hmm. and be willing to stay at it for a long time because you're right and because yeah. you, but because the thing that you need to do has to happen yeah. and and that's that's what happens and it you know you you may find that you made tactical errors along the way but that your basic premise is correct and that your a way to get to that 
to that end state can happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, <laughs> we, we have no guarantees in any of this stuff that we're, yeah. that we're going to win. But y you have to believe that you're right. And you have to be willing to hang in there for a really long time. Well, and I loved it. And we'll get, we'll move off this. But in that discussion, you had that brief exchange about why aren't progressives just saying high taxes are a good thing? You know, and let's do let's do a decade of public education work to firmly cement that idea. And I think it's that it's that combo package sometimes that we miss. You know, that that surprising message that feels counterintuitive and scary. You don't just throw that once out like a little asteroid burning out in the atmosphere once. You actually work at the stuff time day after day, year after year, and that's what really creates the change. But, you know, the last thing, and I know we're almost at time, but, the th you know, he talks about facts matter. You guys had a really interesting conversation about that, how they leverage, you know, this this research agenda and push that out and talked about validators and the power of, of you know, the generals and the folks that they found to validate this perspective. And, and that a hundred of the validators carrying an unsuspected message was more powerful than a thousand validators, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the way I think about this is that if a thousand dogs bark... Who cares? If 104 <laughs> dogs fly, that's interesting. <laughs> that's right. No, that's great. You know, and then he talks about exposing hypocrisy. But the last thing I want to talk about, the notion of building from within. And, you know, again, Aaron going to um, military colleges and being a professor, not as an act activist, but just saying, these are the facts. Here's the data. Again, that instinct and that willingness to say, you know, I'm just going to carry this message wherever it belongs at great personal risk, always, most likely, but the bravery and the courage that goes along with that, plus this, the clarity of thought that that's a step I'm going to take, you know, it's just, it sounds so simple built from within, but when you really look at what that looks like, there's real courage at work here, you know, to say, Hey, I'm going to actually stand up and carry this message. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about the military is it is, is that it is a very um, it is a regimented yeah. institution <laughs> right. and and it it is not uh, beyond the realm of possibility that somebody who is advocating to undo Don't Ask, Don't Tell would be invited to speak in front of a military college. It's actually not impossible. Right. It would be harder right. To talk about climate change inside the Hudson Institute, perhaps. Sure. But yeah. I, I think that the the general premise is correct, which is you go anywhere and everywhere to share your message with anyone who will listen. Yeah. And even if those people are not going to agree with you or if they're going to, you know, you, you're not going to persuade them, you need to get out there and keep making that me making these arguments and right now of course a lot of folks are like i don't talk to the other side hell of them you know they're they're crazy and and on the one hand emotionally that feels very satisfying but uh, it may well be that you end up making arguments that people are persuaded by or uh, are softened to or you build relationships on things maybe thin layers of common ground that you can find i'm not i'm still not giving up on the fact that you can that we can we can find some areas of of common interest and and take advantage of that and there are a lot of folks I will never agree with on on some very fundamental things but I, I can probably find something to agree on and and to be able to get into those places and have those conversations and try your best to build those relationships feels like like it's worth it that that yeah, at the very least you have to explore it. Because in the end, we're just fighting these kind of, it's like trench warfare. And we're, we're winning five yards and digging a new trench and then losing yeah. it back again. And no yeah. one's really making any headway. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, and you, you didn't talk about it explicitly, but it seems like what's implied in what Aaron was working on with Don't Ask, Don't Tell was success. Like ensuring that our military is successful and can accomplish its mission using the best and the brightest and the most capable people possible. So why are we not allowing the best and the brightest and the most capable to participate because of these other distinctions and that conversation around readiness and success, you know, that people from across the board who have that consideration around the military might find common ground there. Right. Yeah. They just have to be convinced. That's yeah. right. And when he made the argument about the linguists who were, who were fired and then we had 9-11. It was an extremely powerful argument. He, and he pretty much said, like, that was, we basically won with that one. Wow. That was yeah. what it took because that that trumped everything. That that trying to 
protect the United States against terrorism is is more important than keeping gays and, and lesbians out of the military. Well, Aaron Belkin, director of the Palm Center on his own website with his all of his writing at AaronBelkin.org and on Twitter at Aaron Belkin. Aaron, wow. Thank you. Eric, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was really fun. Like I said, I just admire Aaron so much. He's such a generous guy. He's really smart. Yeah. He's someone we all can learn from. That was Aaron Belkin on Let's Hear It. Uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show, and that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank John Beltrano, our enthusiastic production assistant. John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music. Our sponsors, the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent, and you can find that at luminafoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest, and of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, everybody, until next time. Let's hear it. Ready when you are. <laughs> okay. This is okay. You're just so frustrated. <laughs> You're so prepared. You're just like, I'm working with an amateur. I can't believe how far. Can't work like this. How far I've fallen. I was on broadcast television. That's right. I was on a network. And now I'm with a dork in my dining room who can't stop laughing. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you.